if you were in 1989 or 1995, you would have looked at that time and you would have said, oh, this internet thing, there's nothing there because you would have been looking at through the lens of the previous system. So I saw, I saw what people said at that time and how they dismissed me and what it looked like and what would it look like. All the companies that don't exist today, right? There's a whole bunch of companies that don't exist today that at that time would have laughed me out the door. Maybe I'm wrong, right? You have to say, you have to, you have to go into, okay, maybe Jeff, maybe there's something Jeff didn't see or find. So, so take that, take everything about, say, with that lens and say, and, um, but if I'm not, and I think I've done, I've done maybe more work than anybody on this to make sure that I'm not, um, the, if I'm not, then it means. I want to start with your favorite quote, Jeff which is, what's your thoughts, they become your words. What's your words, they become your actions. And what's your actions, they become your habits. What's your habits, they become your character. And what's your character, they become your destiny. Uh, how did you come across this quote? And in what way have you managed to implement it into your own life? Um, I can't remember where I saw it the first time. Um, I, the, uh, but, uh, but it grabbed me. Um, it, because I just felt it true in my own life. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so for me, how, how I think about these things, I think about the, the mere reflection of, of my beliefs or my beliefs and actions are the life I create. Um, and, and it's hard to see, it's really hard to see when you yourself are doing something that creates an action that you don't like because it's it's really it's way easier to blame others it's way easier to look outside of yourself um so th- one of the reasons i like that quote is it just continues to keep yourself to keep me grounded and and kind of follow and 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 and, and realize that it's it's me who controls i control all my time i control everything i do so it's ultimately me who has the responsibility for the reflection I see of in the world. Mm. I like that. That's really nice. The kind of um, the book I'm reading now. I don't know if you've have you read any Anthony Dumello. I haven't. He's got a he's got a book called Awareness, and yeah, he's basically saying any time you have a negative feeling, you have to fundamentally realize that that has got nothing to do with the other person. You are the only one who, at the end of the day, is responsible for that negative feeling. And you don't have to associate yourself with it. You can just recognize it and then try and move on for it instead of trying to change the other person or your environment. Um, the most important thing is just to kind of change yourself. Yeah, and, and, and it just a, a, a lot of work or a lot of things I've think, thought about. It's something, some, anything somebody else says to you uh, doesn't have the ability to hurt you without your permission. Right. If somebody mm. says it, it's, 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 it's your, it's your feeling, it's your interpretation of what they're saying and what, that, what that means to you that typically hurt, uh, hurts you. We are completely in control of that yet. We don't realize we're in control of it. So we spend a lot of time in our life pushing the way that pushing away things, um, that, uh, or, or attracting things to our lives that actually don't make our lives better. And we spend our time mm. there thinking that it's somebody else where we can't change them. Mm. And you kind of just, yeah, I guess you end up being subconsciously controlled all the time by what other people say and do in your environment when, yeah, when in truth, it's you, your brain and your thoughts that, that really matter. I want to, um, yep. I want to, I want to dive into your background a little bit because you have an uh, amazing track history of numerous businesses you've started and advised and Goldman Sachs even mentioned you as the top 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs and I was wondering if this is a kind of is this something you always knew you would become when you were younger and um, <laughs> and what was your life like growing up not not the intriguing entrepreneur <laughs> part but just generally an entrepreneur yeah. <laughs> yeah um I would say no the answer is absolutely no um if if you had asked me what I would be doing now, even 10 years ago, if 20 years ago, certainly I wouldn't know. I would, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I wanted to, I knew 
just going to school and kind of finding a job wasn't for me. I was only, I was more curious. Uh, so, so I wanted to hack success and I wanted to, uh, it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about learning. I'd love, I love learning. In fact, I still read 50 books a, a year and, and have since I was 19 years old, 18 years old. Um, so it, it was about, it was about trying to find a way to deliver kind of value or the life I wanted to live. Mm, I see. And so out of curiosity, did you, did you go to university? What was your early education like? Yeah, so I went to university, but I went to university literally for um, six months and dropped out. Mm. What were, what were um, you studying? Then, uh, yeah, first arts, and then uh, then then I uh, and and then dropped out to go into real estate. Um, and, and really, and, and in real estate, I went into selling real estate, and then I ended up buying a real estate company. Um, and then I started a building company. Uh, and then a technology company after that. And so it was just a, a path of, of trying to find my way, trying to find a, a way to create value and making a ton of mistakes along the way, tons of mistakes along the, uh, the way. It was, uh, um, and learning most of the mistakes, most of my biggest learnings were, and we talked about it when we first opened this, most of my biggest learnings were not what the world was conspiring against me. Most of my biggest learnings were where I was conspiring against the world. It was all internal. Um, those were those were the breakthroughs that created uh, um, created real value in my life to be able to do things differently. Mm. And were those then kind of was that doubt or or fear for what you were doing? What kind of yeah? What kind of internal failures? And revelations were those. Well, it's easy to think. Uh, so, uh, 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 th this isn't an example of that. But when when you start in real estate and you're 19 years old in real estate, and your parents was it a real estate uh, a real estate house, agent? I'm guessing. Real estate real estate agent. Your parents kick you out of the house because because they're so mad because you didn't go that you didn't finish school. And you decide to go on your own and you decide to not just go on your own, but you're going to rent a desk. I decided I'm going to rent a desk. I'm going to be a hundred percent responsible for, for this. I had no idea what to do. And no one at my age was buying real estate. So I got my first, my, so my first day, what do you do? You have a big empty desk with a phone on it um, and a phone book. And this is before Google, right? And so mm. I picked up the phone book and I started making calls. Now, when you're making uh, phone calls to people that you don't know if they own real estate or want to own real estate, what do you say when you're just cold calling people? And I made tens mm. of thousands of those calls just because I didn't know what else to do. And, and through that process, um, now it was really hard because most people just hang up the phone on you um, and you want to stop. But through that process on continuing to go through that that wall, you learn how to do that better, and then you develop def different techniques, and um, and um, and then you decide, wait, that didn't work. I'm going to try so something else. So through that perseverance, you get better at what you're doing. And if you actually want to create, if 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 the intention of creating uh, real estate isn't just value for yourself, if you think if you truly want to deliver value for somebody else. Then eventually that comes through, mm. and um, and you find success, and then that perseverance and success turns into better ways of doing that, and that error correction or pushing through and, and creating the, the error correction that you have first tr tried is the way to be successful in just about anything, um, and so most of I, I, I even like to say today it's hard to train an entrepreneur. Right, it's hard to go to school to say, "Here's all the things you should be to do an, to be an entrepreneur." Because an entrepreneur thinks differently. An entrepreneur just goes. They say, "I'm going to go and do this right now. And I'm going to figure it out as I, I do it. I'm going to make a whole bunch of mistakes." Um, the confidence doesn't come in in a confidence that you're not going to make mistakes. It's not a 
is that confidence comes in, in from a, I am going to learn how to do this in the best way possible. Mm-hmm. And knowing that when you do fail, it's not the end of the when world. When you, 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 you do, when you do, yeah, when you, when you, when you do fail, yeah, exactly. The failure isn't a failure in, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, and you're failing, then obviously it's something that you're doing. It comes back mm. to our other conversation. It's you, it's the way that you're, uh, you're doing it. It's the way that you're, uh, um, it's the people around you. It's the, that you're choosing. It's the way that you're attack, attacking something. When you believe that you have nowhere to hide, it's you. And you find the things mm-hmm. in you that are able to that, that you're able to change, and those things, um, and those things tend to to have remarkable breakthroughs in your life. Hmm. Would you say that was your biggest lesson from your time spent in cold calling? Uh, it, I would say that's the biggest lesson. That's one of the bigger lessons of my life. Um, not just cold calling, not just cold calling was an example of, uh, of that, but, uh, but there's examples everywhere in, in, in my life. I, 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 um, one of the things, and I've said this on lots of podcasts, so do, forgive me, forgive the people who have heard this before, but if you look at, if you look at somebody, um, who, you know, is a victim, a mentality of a victim and you say, um, what ends up happening? What are they actually really searching for? And what they're really searching for is love and belonging. That's the highest level that we all look for in, in our lives. And so that's what they're looking for too. And they, and what they have by being a victim is a sign on their forehead pointed outwards that everyone else can read that, that is pushing them further and further away from love and belonging. And why is because the first time they're a victim, everybody races to them. And it feels so good for them that they keep using that tool, that sign on their forehead saying, wow, that's the way I get love. And it becomes ingrained in them. And then what ends up happening is people start moving away from them and nobody turns the sign around for that person. Instead, what those people, all their friends say is, I don't want to hurt their feelings. When the truth is what they're really saying is I care more about me than them. And very few people will turn the sign around so the person can hear it. Most people will talk about that person behind their back. And what ends up happening is those people move away from that person. That person typically doubles down and creates more drama to try to bring them back. And they move further and further away. And out of that example, you can see for the victim, love is all around them all the time but they don't know it because they they're pushing it away with all their might. They're creating that reflection that they see in the world. And so what I recognized it, um, if that's true for the victim and they can't see it in themselves, then it's true for me too. In some other part of my life that I can't see it's true for the billionaire who's trying to say it's all about work, right. And pushing their family away. Um, it's true for all of us because we all primarily think about love and belonging first and different ways about get, uh, getting that. So where in me does that show up that nobody would tell me? And who do I want to be around that I've that, that I, I want to spend all my time with around around people who would turn my sign around and I'll turn their sign around. That's kind of how I think about my life. Um, mm. and And when you're thinking about that, you're more attuned to catch things that you're doing that, that, that when, uh, that, that don't deliver the path that you want them want to. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I see the, to not the same depth as your example, but yeah, I see it in my personal life when you almost feel like, say, you need to make X amount of money, you need to be X successful. I think a lot of young people, I've definitely found at my age, find the same thing. You kind of feel like you need to do this or X, Y to kind of have that sense of belonging, to feel, I guess, loved, I guess. And it's almost like you have to constantly remind yourself, oh, no, you don't. You just look after yourself, be happy, spend time with friends and focus on 
I guess, a purpose or something you want to work on. And I, don't worry too much ironically, about that. Ironically, yeah. Yeah, ironically, on on what you're saying is that actually pushes a lot. Oftentimes, pushes away what you really want. You tell yourself mm. a lie to be able to, to. I need this much money. You don't really need any. The money is a tool to get what you get what you want. And I'm not saying. And there's nothing wrong with love and belonging. It's a really great thing. It's it's if it if it takes you away from getting what you, uh, what you want. So you, it's, it, it's when it's so powerful that we won't see that the exact same thing we're trying to get, we're pushing away. Mm. We'll tell ourselves a lie. Um, and so, so when, when that's resonant in yourself all the time and you realize that if, if everyone else is susceptible to it, when you look around, when I see people, when I meet people, I can actually almost see right through them. I can see what they really want. And that's, a, and, and that's powerful in connecting with people. Um, mm. the, the, be, because if I ha, if, when I saw everyone has the same thing and I have the same thing, then those, uh, then, then, um, then those things, if you can break through those things are really big, cha- really, really big changes. And it develops, uh, and, and when people, people know that you're not out there talking about them behind their back, you're only talking about the great in them behind their back. They tend to do that to you too. Mm. Definitely. Have you watched game of Thrones by any chance? I, I I have because I I remember watching a video a while ago talking about Tyrion and breaking down his character and how such a small but very clever imp could rise and gain so much power is that all the relationships he had and whoever you'd meet he would he would always slip in or ask them what do you want and figure figure basically what they're what they were really looking for. And then he would then leverage that or use that to either become friends with them or to help himself. Um, which is, yeah, a funny, <laughs> funny comparison. Yeah. Now, now again, if you had, if you had that, if you actually thought through life like that, you could use, you could use that to manipulate people as well. That's a danger. Mm. Of that. Or you could use it to, or you could use it to help people. I would assume if, if you used it to manipulate people that your life wouldn't be very, you, at the end of it, you would, you would think you were trading on, you were, you would be trying to get success by mani- in a different, in a different form of love instead mm. of the success that you, you're probably, you're pro- you, in that example, you'd probably push people away and think that you were winning. Mm. I, 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 I've known lots of people like that. Mm. I want to then come back to you, you as a young real estate agent. You said you you went from being a real estate agent to then buying property and then buying a business. Was that with capital that you had then saved up from your time as a young real estate agent? Yeah, so so going into real estate and then living on my own, I literally had nothing. Um, I made Mm. craft dinner and and ramen noodles every day, um, trying to trying to make it through. And then um, I remember the first listing I got and the, and, and the, the, this gruff person and, and this, the house had been listed by uh, two times before by top realtors. And this gruff uh, <laughs> uh, person came to the door. I knocked on his door and he, and, and, and literally uh, it looks like I'm wearing my dad's suit um, the, uh, at 19, I looked 15 and, uh, um, and, and he said, and he laughed when I came to the door and he, and he, and he, he said, why he said, what, I won't swear here, but tell us why the hell would I hire you when these other agents, uh, couldn't do it. And I said to him, I said, cause I have nothing else. You're, this would be it. This is all I have, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll make sure uh, I, do, I, I do the best job. I literally have nothing, <laughs> and uh, and and 
And anyways, I got the listing and then I sold the house and then I, then a whole bunch of, he told other people about that and, and it started to turn into something, but that, um, and, and I was honest and, and, mm. and, 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 and it showed. So the thing that I didn't have, I made a strength, right? The thing I didn't have any experience, success, other listing of anything else. I made my weakest thing a strength for him. And, uh, and, and it turned into something so that, that turned into, and I probably outworked everybody, um, at first really poorly, but bad, bad. I like, I made mistakes, made mistakes, but I probably outworked everybody. And I actually truly, and not that others didn't, but I truly cared about my clients and, and that created a lot of wealth very fast. Now for mm-hmm. probably for six months, it didn't, um, because I was trying to build that. And then there was that, then that breakthrough just started to create a lot of wealth, uh, 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 very fast. And then I bought my first place and then I renovated it and sold and I bought my second place and I'm living with friends at the time. Um, and they're renting rooms and it's, it's like a frat house. It's, a um, it, uh, tons of fun. Um, and I was having a lot of success and, and then I ended up buying the real estate company, uh, with some others that, that I worked at. Um, and that was not, a, a, that was not successful. Um, hire, um, in, uh, managing other realtors was a different game than actually being a realtor. Right. And I didn't know mm. that. I thought that they were one, uh, one and the same. And then I, um, and then I started a building company. And I started a building company because one of my houses, um, a family wanted to move into one of my uh, houses and it was the only thing and it was the best school for, uh, best school in the city that I lived in. Um, and they couldn't afford to, to move into that, uh, neighborhood. Um, and so I, I went home to my roommates that night and I said, listen, I'm going to sell my house to these people. Um, and so we're going to be moving. Um, and they said, what are you doing? I, uh, um, and, and I called another friend who was a builder and I said, would you teach me how to build? I'll pay you to teach me how to build. And so, and then he became my partner in a building company. Um, and we built to one house for myself and one house on spec. Um, and, and so, and then I, and, and the people I sold my house to, I sold it under value just so they could get into the neighborhood, but that became the building company (laughs) that, and then that, um, and then the building company started in a cycle where, where the, where the one house that was built on spec, um, wasn't selling, wasn't selling, wasn't selling. Um, and, and then we finally sold it and didn't made no money on it. But as we sold it, somebody else said, can you build us the exact same house? And all of a sudden now I have a building company. So I have real estate company and, and a building company and the building company then just took off. Um, and, and out of that problem, I created my first tech tech company because I couldn't deliver a house on time to a, to a family. Um, and I was frustrated and that, ha- and, and that house I couldn't deliver uh, on time I was frustrated because the flooring didn't arrive on time and it pushed back the whole schedule. I mean, I had to put that family in a, in a hotel and furniture and storage. And I was mad. Um, and, and there was nowhere to look about me, but the supply chain for building supplies. Like if, ever, if you ask people today about trying to build a house and the frustration, it looks really frustrating. So then I built a technology mm. company to solve that, solve that problem. And that technology company at one time at its peak was worth over 500 million us. Um, and, and so all of these were just problems that I saw along the way or opportunities that I saw to solve problems for other people that turned into, to, to a a career of doing that. Hmm. Wow. What a, what a, what a story. By the way, by the way, that's that, that, that ends that insight and same thing with the book I wrote, the price of tomorrow. When, when I understood that technology was reducing prices at the rate that it, that it was and why were prices moving up, 
I talked about it all the time. And when I, so that's a huge problem in the world that needed a solution. And, and nobody was talking about the problem. You had technology people on one side saying how much money you could make, including me, right? In a system that had to, in an inflationary monetary system that had to steal the productivity gains from that technology, because the productivity gains from that technology that is in everything should be flowing to society in the form of lower prices. But the monetary system that we live in is inflationary um, and it would collapse without, if you allow, allowed that pricing to flow to, to society in the form of lower prices. So the monetary system that we live in, which is inflationary and based on credit, had to keep expanding and making prices more expensive. And that, and at the highest level, besides my company, besides anything I was ever doing, at the highest level, all humanity interacting together was facing a, a, an imminent problem that you had two systems colliding against each other that were incompatible together. Technology was going to keep moving exponentially. And to try to solve that, governments were making the problem worse for all of society. And that was going to rip apart society. So that problem is why I wrote my book, and which became a bestseller, um, The Price of Tomorrow. And so all of these things, an entire path was just looking for problems. And so, so I would recommend to entrepreneurs today, um, if you're thinking about things in the world we live in today, um, anytime there's a problem, then if you can understand the problem at its root cause and, and try to find a way to help other people and fix that problem, you can create a whole bunch of value for you and society. There's a, so in a world that you see a whole bunch of problems, celebrate them because that's a, that it's signaling how much opportunity there is today. Mm. What are, what are some of the, the biggest problems that you see today that you wish, or say, if you were younger, you would love to solve, but you just don't have the time. So, uh, so the thing is I have the time I, 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 I I started ego death capital, uh, investing in, in entrepreneurs on top of the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, because we are going, we're moving from a monetary system that existed in our entire lives. that was based on effectively theft, right? Because inflation is theft. You don't vote for inflation. So Hidden inflation tax. is the same as wage. Yeah, exactly. So inflation is the same as wage deflation. And so what it means is to pretend there's jobs. And this is why you, you are feeling, I can't keep up. How do I make more money? Um, well, technology is removing jobs to keep jobs. Effectively, people are getting paid a lot less and it, it's, it's concentrating that product, those productivity gains that should be flowing to society in very few hands. And so that's a system that 99% of 99.9% .9 of people on the planet are, are stuck in and operating in, and there's no way out from that system. And Bitcoin's creating a parallel system that is a bridge across to a new system that brings essentially truth, hope, abundance to society. And what's, and, and, and if you, if this is the first time you've heard about Bitcoin, you'll probably push back because the system that you live in is so powerful and you're probably hearing, oh, it's just Bitcoin. It's this, but if you actually investigate what I'm saying at a deeper level and understand where that opportunity lies, then you, then there's an entire ecosystem building in this parallel, in this parallel, um, uh, uh, it's early, but in this parallel system that provides enormous value to society. Mm -hmm. I agree. Definitely. I mean, so then do you see when you look at the world today, would you say the biggest problems or the most in problems, the most important problems that you think could be solved would be you would focus in, say, the Bitcoin ecosystem or or do you still look outside? Yeah, so so that's where uh yeah, I, that's for me, that's where, because, because by solving the problems in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you're also solving many of the other society problems as a, as a sub, as a sub benefit. So today to understand how the 
we, we don't typically um, look at the plumbing in entrepreneurs, or at least somebody who thinks in first principles, like myself, wants to understand things at their very basic. And then even when I made the mistake, I want to understand that so I can fix it and move forward. So I want to ask, getting to first principles, ask why five times, and you'll get to the root of typical problems and, and be curious on why does you could use this in, on inflation. Why, why do we have inflation? Right. And some people will say, um, because, uh, because an economy wouldn't work without it. Well, why wouldn't an economy work without theft and money? Right. And why wouldn't, and, and so, so you could get down to the root of any problem by asking five, five uh, whys, or it's a good way, or it's at least one good way to get to first principles. Why is that? And actually be really curious about the answer once you're there. So then if in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, we don't typically look at the plumbing. Most people don't about what makes up the base level of Bitcoin and why would I say what I'm saying right now? I've done that work, but very few people would have done that work on, on could this actually be something that changes a system and what would that, uh, would, what would that look, uh, look like? Similarly, we don't look at the plumbing in the existing financial system. We look at the products that are built on top of the plumbing, right? So we look at Google, we look at Facebook, we're, we're on, on this same technology that we're using right now. That's given us a whole bunch of value in our lives without understanding the base that gave the products that value TCP IP, all the internet protocols up to HTTP, TP, the protocol stack that built that. So we look at the value driver on top of the system and we don't understand where, when the system itself is, uh, is not working very well. Similarly in, in Bitcoin, most people don't want to spend the time going into the plumbing and what's happening today in that system is the products are starting to be built on top of the plumbing in a layered, layered uh, approach, similar to, uh, so similar to the inter uh, internet and the products that are being built will, will ensure you won't even have to think about Bitcoin. It won't, you won't have to think about what it looks like today. They'll deliver tons of value to your life without even ever know without ever really thinking about it. It'll fade to the background in, in the plumbing. And so you can think about in that ecosystem, similarly to remember it TCP IP in the internet protocol came out in the late sixties by DARPA. It wasn't until HTTP in, in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee that, that hyperlinked all of the websites together that could create the World Wide web. Now, if you were in 1989, and I know you're too young to be <laughs> um, there, but if you were in 1989 or 1995, you would have looked at that time and you would have said, oh, this internet thing, there's nothing there because you would have been looking at through the lens of the previous system. And, um, and that's why so many people missed it. Remember the iPhone, which people uh, it didn't even come out till 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. And people can't imagine their life without the iPhone to, uh, today. They can't imagine a world that didn't exist. Uh, before and all the interactions today, that same thing is building and people are misjudging that and what's going it, what it's going to do for their lives on top of the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, on top of a decentralized secure protocol that cannot be stopped by any government that actually expands. And as it expands, as it provides security and decentralization, it, it changes a whole bunch of different structures. So it's something I'm wildly excited about because it actually benefits all of humanity and, and it benefits the entrepreneurs who are building on top of that ecosystem, as long as they're delivering value to other people. Hmm. I'm very excited as well. How yeah. do you, it's interesting with this whole backdrop and the, the rise of the rise of the whole Bitcoin ecosystem, um, the the long term debt cycle and the fourth turning is something that we also kind of we hear about a lot today. Which, for readers who don't know, it's basically a generational theory for how every eighty to one hundred years you kind of you enter this period of destabilization and 
the, there's, there's often a major crisis. And if we go back 80 years today, that would be World War II. And I was wondering, what's your framework for the next five to 10 years? And, and how do you kind of, how do you see things playing out? Because I know you've written about this a little bit. Yeah, so so that frame that framework and even the fourth turning, I think you need to put it into a context of here's what here's what happens in that 80 to 100 years. It's actually it, it, historically it was longer than that. And now it's faster than that. Um, and and I think what gave rise to the fourth turning and gave rise to everything is technology has always been deflationary human action, us finding ways to do better things. We, and us using the, the tools to make things better is deflationary by nature, brings prices down. But we've never lived in a system where money wasn't manipulated to gain control and then drive inflation rate when, 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 um, when you couldn't pay your bills. Never in history. And so when you get to these cycles that the inflation rate is pushed because you're manipulating money further and further, all money is, is information. And so if you're manipulating money, you're manipulating information and it's spreading throughout society. And if you're paying, if you're pretending to pay people the same while paying them less because you're manipulating money, then society starts to rise up and, and society starts to look for, and how you get elected, why, why these turn into world wars is how you get elected in that cycle is you convince some people in your country that they're not to blame. It's those other people. That's those other bad people in the country. But once you're elected in the country, it's not enough to just divide your country and benefit. Yeah. By the way, we as humans generally believe that nonsense because it's easier to believe, put a, put a face on somebody else. That's the problem rather than a system problem. So we are super susceptible to that. And so we, we, we lean into the person we believe is, saying our values and we turn against other people and it creates division within a country. And the only way to hold power because, because that division is persistent inside your country is you have to create a bigger enemy outside your borders and why these turn into historical events that turn into war world. You could say world war one wasn't solved and world war two was the extension of uh, world war one. And we're in the middle of World War Three right now with, with not really realizing it. And it's all because of money. It's all as a, as a rise up because that problem hasn't been solved. It's been kicked that down. The, 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 the can has been kicked down the road, but it hasn't been uh, solved. And all trade is, is that money and information trade between you and I or anywhere in the world. It's our time. So if you're manipulating it, you're manipulating people's time. And, that, and if you trust a government, it, that's okay for a government to do. You're not seeing the impact of somebody in a, in a, in a different land that is, is the negative benefic- the negative outcome from your ben- benefit. And so that's what's, what's happening all over the world. Um, and to solve that, you need a neutral reserve currency that the governments can't control. And so over the over the next and and then worse, most people um, most people um, measure an economy or the or a system. Your human your body is is a nonlinear system, and and what that means is you you could eat really unhealthy for a long time and then have a cascading failure in your health that you never saw develop because, uh, because of that, but you'd get away with it for a long time. And the economy is the same. There's so many different inputs to an economy or that it does, it's not a linear system. And so that means tiny little things make a big difference over time, that butterfly effect and they explode. And so when you're, uh, when you're me- measuring not, um, a, an economy or human body or anything like that, you have to think in chaos theory, chaos theory is a better way to look at things and in critical states. And, and those are hard to, well, everybody thinks they can predict them. They can't be predicted, but you can predict the trend. You can predict, you can predict what's happening kind of in the failure rate of the end uh, in the smaller things. And, and my book lays lays out effectively one of those big changes 
that if technology is deflationary, then why aren't prices falling? Um, when we were using more and more technology, and it seems a pretty logical, uh, uh, pretty logical uh, thesis. And when you find the other side of that thesis is because the debt's already insolvent in the world. There's call it four hundred trillion dollars of debt in the world that is there's no way to pay back without manipulating money or defaulting. And if you default, everything stops because the world lives on top of that credit. Mm. So we're all in that system and we realize and everybody knows they're in that system and they know that the debt can't be paid back and they accept, okay, well, we're going to trust this leader who is going to manipulate money more to pretend it can be paid back without accepting the consequences of what that would do. And so if you know you're in that system and you know that the, uh, that, that system dominates your time, and it also dominates all the second order consequences of that, what the division of society, then you might want to ask, is there another system outside of that system that could produce a different result? Hint, hint. <laughs> so then for, if we kind of bring it back to bring it back to kind of young people heading into this world and this, the, the seeming collapse of one system. And I liked your nonlinear analogy of the human body because it's kind of, it's like what Foss says is risk, risk happens fast. And so when these things yeah, start to collapse fair. or things start yeah. to go badly, they happen very quickly. So, I mean, that can be quite a daunting idea to a lot of people. I wondered what what would you what would you say to those people? Um, well, I would I, I would say if your risk is if your risk is all inside the existing system, if everything you're doing in the in the existing system is, I can guarantee you, you have more risk than you think. Um, and and that's why that's that's why I talk about Bitcoin and and to get people to start to understand if they started to investigate a different system that could uh, benefit them, they'll at least move some of their time into the new system. Now, if they start to move a little bit of their time or a little bit of their energy, and as they start to learn it, they will see a shift. They will likely see a shift in their attitude and everything else because it is a different system. Now, and as if they liked that and they liked what there was the potential there, they'd shift more of their time. And so that's all I'm, I'm talking about. You, you asked um, kind of what would I do? And I, and I am doing what I would do. And it doesn't matter what age I'm doing it. I'll continue to do this type of thing forever because I cannot believe I get to. I cannot believe I get to spend time with some of the best entrepreneurs in the world building a new system or building new value that can create value for a whole bunch of other people. It's a privilege. And, and, and so if I'm starting out in the world, um, and I'm in the existing system and I'm measuring everything from the existing system, everything we're talking about Suzuki would be really hard to see because my measurement is the existing system. And mm -hmm. I, I probably, uh, and many people wouldn't investigate the new system at the level that we're talking about because they would be trapped and that trap and being trapped there would create a lot of risk for them. And so, but if you're investigating, and here's another area separate from what I'm talking about. Um, probably today, 95% of companies on the planet are, are, have teams of people uh, all the way up to CEO um, looking at open AI on how it can reduce labor in their business and make their business more profitable. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So those people are looking at open AI and they're, uh, and, and they're trying to reduce labor in their businesses um, and make their businesses more efficient. And the marketing person that's using it isn't realizing that they're actually making their job irrelevant over time. And the CEO that's using it isn't realizing that they're making, uh, making a whole bunch of uh, jobs uh, irrelevant over time. What they're trying to do is save money, make more, create more value. And as the output of that value is they're going to redu reduce labor. And then there's a, then that same exact technology without any people 
is available for people to use to create a new business. And that, um, and, and so some people will create new businesses with that, te- with that technology without any of the costs uh, associated. Big implications for the overall market of labor, but lots of opportunities inside, at least early opportunities inside that for people to create value. All right, Jeff. So you, the where you left off was kind of, you were speaking about AI and all these kind of these CEOs and I guess workers kind of being excited about it, bringing it into the business without realizing that it might actually be taking their own jobs. And kind of, you were then touching on that the, what you should kind of do there is kind of move on to see the new opportunities that that then opens up. Because I think a lot of people get caught up with a new technology and it's kind of then um, you, people get scared that, oh, these jobs are going to be lost or these jobs are going to be lost. But I think what you're trying to say is that what often happens in that case is that it leaves room for more jobs to appear or different jobs in a kind of way that the, I don't know, the internet might have removed a lot of jobs, but now we have influencers who make their money from blogging and YouTube videos. Um, so could you kind of flesh out a little bit about how you see AI changing things and then also maybe some of the opportunities that you think could arise during that? Okay. So, um, and, and I wrote about this quite extensively in my book too, that, that effectively said um, human intelligence is error correction. And, and us on top of error correction over time, our, in our intelligence or our ability to solve problems just keeps getting better. It's an, exp- it's an exponential change because we're standing on the shoulders of greatness that went before us and we're correcting errors all the time. Um, that, that it, all is happening today is that is moving into machines and machines in time, you could say 10 years, 20 years, whenever, but to, machines in time may be small, smarter than all of us. And then as that happens, those machines as well um, will be merging with robotics and they'll be able to do things that we can't even imagine um, and be able to, to, uh, to and, and that should get better and better and better. And so today, if you're measuring in, in that and you believe that jobs always go up because of the, because, because there's always new opportunities and, and, and uh, later, you're not measuring actually what's happening with intelligence specifically, because we've never had, when we had electricity, it changed a bunch of industries. And that was a general purpose technology that made a whole, created a whole bunch of uh, more jobs, but, um, and it destroyed jobs before that, but we've never had technology that would be, that we would be smarter than us and that we would be more capable than us. We had technology that in, empowered us rather than um uh, rather than was smarter than us so this is very different mm. um okay. very different and so i think many people are caught in a false belief that we'll always have more jobs because the technology is going to produce produce industries that we can't even see t- um tomorrow and i think that that and and what the problem with that is 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 what should happen with that technology, uh, if I'm right, actually, regardless of if I'm right, that the, the intelli- the, you're going to have intelligent machines that are going to be smarter than us, than us, what should happen as that productivity enters society is prices should fall and they should keep falling. And that would, and if they fell at the rate that the productivity entered in society, what it would mean is you would constantly be getting more for less. And so your wage might go down or your hours a week might move from 40 hours to 30 hours to 20 hours to 10 hours to four hours to get the exact same or more than you get today. That's what should happen. But out of the existing financial system, it can't. And so, so what, what you leave the society paralyzed because they're afraid of the jobs being lost and they're in a system that is designed to work exactly the opposite way, essentially stealing their time, making them work more and more and more to a point of a breaking point where they, where they can't feed their families or they can't pay for their housing. So that's what, that, that's the difference with the two systems, the new system, the, 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 where technology is going, it requires a system change. 
Mm. Because governments live off, well, survive from taking on more and more debt. And because we have so much debt, you can't afford for prices to go down because the ability for them to pay off the debt gets harder and harder. So the only thing that they will kind of do is print more and more and more and more. Yeah, and 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 when you think about when you say governments, um, it's it's really we the people we determine our governments, and and very few people would vote for um, for prices to come down because we've never lived in that society. So it's easy for us to say if if you had a choice between two people and said and one person said, listen, you're going to get paid less less next year, but that being paid less next year, you're going to make your time is going to be saved. You're going to have more from getting paid less versus somebody that said, I'm going to pay you more next year. Who would you want to believe? Um, and, and so what you see in there is we want to believe the lie that is inflation is good for us because we think of ourselves as we can outpace it ourselves. We can, and all of those other people will, will make more by, by, by being a winner, but it, produces a really chaotic society. So it's not intern governments, we elect the governments and, and we give them the power to be able to create that, that essentially theft and money over, over us because of that false belief. Um, and why, and, and why we would never vote for a system like Bitcoin, or at least enough people wouldn't vote for a system like Bitcoin that took that power away from us. You had to, that system had to emerge but with the same game theory that created a whole bunch of wealth for early people on bitcoin and created an ecosystem that was building on top of it and then that what what people are seeing in that is that price rising in bitcoin is the first thing that they see and to understand what we're talking about and so a lot of people go in it for the price and then they start to understand how money is designed and how politics is designed on top of that and everything is, and they start to, I, I call it, many in Bitcoin call it going down the rabbit hole. And as they start to unwind a bunch of these previous beliefs, they start to see that it's actually not their money. Uh, what's happening with the money is the, the, a neutral money like Bitcoin that can't be inflated ensures all pricing of everything forever falls over time. So it's not Bitcoin going up, it's all prices going down against Bitcoin. That's what's actually happening. Mm. As they say, everything, hold Bitcoin for long enough and everything starts to get cheaper. Um, and, 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 that's, and, 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 and if you, if you, if you realize, it, if, you're not, if, if you don't live in a system where money is being manipulated to make things more expensive, the natural productivity from technology should be flowing to us and that's what mm. should be that that's what should be happening so it, it writes a whole bunch of wrongs in the world but the, those wrongs can't be can't be righted from the existing system it's just impossible for the existing system to to solve that paradox um because we wouldn't let it all mm. over the world we would vote for something that looked very different and so it has to be from an outside in um that measures measures everything differently Hmm. Kind of with this, I feel like as you start to learn more about Bitcoin and you delve into it and you start to expose more and more uh, aspects of kind of the, the fiat world, the, you, well, my view anyway, on like academia, on these big world economic forum institutions, all this kind of thing starts to change ever so slightly. And I was wondering with, say, your son, what what are you going to kind of advise for him to do as he as he grows up in terms of kind of making decisions as to whether to send him to college, um, whether to urge him to work? And like, yeah, how, like, how do you kind of think about that um, as as your children kind of grow up? Yeah, so I think about my kids. I actually don't care what they do. I care that they're happy in what they do and I can give mm. them hints on hits on my life and, and they see that and I, and, and, uh, and, and I'm happier when I'm curious, when I, when I'm, when I'm learning, when I'm kind of on the frontier of knowledge, learning something, something new for me, that it's satisfying when it, it, one of the craziest things is, and actually maybe that's also why Bitcoin's ex, uh, kind of that, uh, 
uh, it solve, it's that curiosity. Um, when I think I know something and then something's brought into view um, that I was wrong, it's actually a positive for me. I don't, I, I look at it as, as a positive. And when you just think error correction is human intelligence, we should always be curious and we should always mm. look to where are, where we were wrong before. So what do I ask for my kids? I ask that, that they find their own path, um, that they're responsible for their own path or accountable to it. And they create, and they create the world they want to see. So, so, and I don't mean, I, I just mean the mere reflection of their beliefs and actions will create their world. And if they believe they're not capable of something, then they won't be capable. They'll attract a whole bunch of that into their lives. And if they believe they're capable or if, if I need to, I fell down, uh, I kept falling down. I kept doing the same thing wrong and I can't blame the world for conspiring against me. It's me conspiring against the world. They'll learn faster to be able to, to find their path in life. Ultimately, if it just says it simplified that, I'd say I just want them. I want them to find what they want to do um, that makes them happy. Hmm. Very nice. There's a there's a piece of your backstory puzzle which we haven't quite covered yet, and um, that's kind of this is after you've founded your building supply chain technology business, and it's how you kind of how did you shift from there? Did did see, did founding that business and realizing that new technology should be pushing prices down was that what started to get you interested in Bitcoin and what kind of what was responsible for you going down the rabbit hole in the first place? So it was it was the experience. It was certainly the experience of that and seeing that everywhere. And then and, and when you're so I was invited to Zeitgeist most years, which is Google Zeitgeist top call it 500 people in the world, technology people in the world. And you're brought into these learning events where you're mixing with other top uh, technology people. So like, when you're on the inside of the technology revolution, and it wasn't just Google Zeitgeist, it was all of the different technology companies. And many, many of the CEOs or founders were friends or, or, or acquaintances that you're on the inside of this. And I could not, and through that process, through the process of my own work and the process of that, I, I couldn't help thinking that they were all talking about how this utopian world was going to look because of technology. Then they were getting really, really wealthy, or we were getting wealthy by consolidating, essentially stealing the productivity that should be flowing to society because we were at the top of that puzzle, we could create a bit business that takes it. And then what ends up happening is as you create more AI, <laughs> you remove the people and you still have all the business. And so we were the beneficiaries of that productivity gain at the expense of the mass majority of uh, the population. I couldn't like have these conferences over and over and over and again, and, and you had almost these islands of information. You had monetary theorists, you had Keynesians, you had Austrian economics, you had all of this, here's how the economy works. And then you had this separate group of people, here's how technology works. And, and they were all talking in their own language, not being able to see that it's the same thing. Um, all mm. we do, the economy is based on the emergent complex behavior of all society is based on us trading with each other. And so, so you cannot separate you can't say, I want my house to go up forever, but I want more and more in my life with what I'm, I'm going to vote with my time to get more for less, right? Those are two, we're a buyer and we're a seller. Every job we, we, uh, we do, if we don't provide value to somebody else through that, that, that job, it doesn't exist. And so, so I couldn't understand why in all of these things, these things weren't, they, they were talking about things in islands of information. So, so, um, that got me really curious, probably I, it might not be full 10 years before I wrote the book, but, but, uh, between five and seven, maybe seven to 10 years before I wrote the book, I started to talk about this all the time. And I talked about it at conferences. I talked about it with my friends and everything else. And, and, and you look like crazy. And I looked like a crazy person. Nobody wanted, nobody cared. 
right? Because mm-hmm. they were making lots of money and didn't matter to them and, and nobody cared. And, and even if, the, uh, even if um, intellectually they could get what I was saying that we had to move into a new system, they couldn't get to, to what that would look like. And all the while as well in my technology company, there were more in the developers community, they were talking about Bitcoin. And then, then they were talking about all the other altcoins and everything else. And, but there was a lot of noise and I'd looked at Bitcoin early and I thought, wow, this is something, but I was too busy in my own business, um, it to, to really take it, uh, take it seriously. And then I looked again and I bought a little bit in 2017, but n- even at that point, I didn't do enough work to realize it was going to transition the entire economic system. Um, and it provided a bridge to the other side. So you just didn't have to go, the whole thing collapses and then you start over into a new, new system. It provided a slow bridge to the other side. Um, I don't think I knew that I didn't know that in, in 2017 and I was still somewhat, um, it, I thought it could be a solution, but I didn't know it was the solution. So I thought potentially mm. there's other things. Maybe it looks like this and something else. And then it was uh, really around writing my book, and uh, and maybe even just after that that I really started deep diving on where would be vulnerabilities on Bitcoin, where are vulnerabilities in the existing system, what would that look like, how would that system develop over time, and taking it almost trying to disprove my hypothesis to uh to to find to find out where i was wrong i took that lens on bitcoin and then when i can't when i realized i can't disprove it and i can't disprove the overall hypothesis that's when i became a uh, that that's when i really went into it and started understand, understanding what it meant hmm. did you manage to find any kind of risk because that's one one thing i when i look at it, i'm always like like where surely there's something like when, when someone's like oh what's the biggest risk and i always find it hard to kind of state or to think of something clear did you kind of did you come towards anything yeah so so a lot of false risks a lot of what people think are risks that are actually not not risks i certainly came to to some of those but i didn't i, I didn't come to one uh um uh, one fundamental risk in 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 the system i really think it's i think i really think and that's why it's a discovery the discovery invention culmination of 40 years of work in in various different cryptography and different to be able to get to that point that you have perfect money that that you can't you can't discover again so Mm -hmm. so and there's a whole bunch of there's too much to talk about in this podcast to be able to to say specifically why why but i would encourage people to do their own work um on that i i I can't remember if i said this on the last call but if you read finding signal in a noisy world um is a good entry to to what we're talking about Mm -hmm. i'll link that in the show notes as we kind of as we wrap up here, then, because I know you you've got to head off. What um what kind of final comments or notes do you want to leave with the listeners? Um, that that there is no they when you when you, when you think about those people when you think about whether it's government or other people then or in in my case if, if people that don't understand Bitcoin and you think you're better that because they don't understand there is no they they it's we um and we are all responsible for creating the world that we want to live in and so so each person can look in the mirror and say say what do i want this to look like and 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 just recognize you you'll reinforce the things you believe and you won't see the things that are the that are outside your beliefs and because because of that and you'll keep on most people will keep on repeating that pattern over and over in their life and think it's other people stopping them from success where, and, and so what I would just encourage people to do is have massive empathy for others that are caught in their own, uh, caught in, uh, caught in their own feedback loop, just because what somebody says about you 
has nothing to do with you them what somebody thinks about you has not has nothing to do about you it has to do it has, it's mostly to do with them so if you if if you can if, if you can see people all over the world with empathy and love and say that they're in in that spot then you can actually probably help them more to to uh, to understand or potentially you're missing something in your life that can that, that can sharpen sharpen you and help your and help your life so that's what i would uh, i would say we are going through a crazy change in structure of society and it's bound to hurt a lot of people and people are going to take sides of this all over the world um and and a bunch of people are in pain so i'd say back off and 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 and, and see um we're <laughs> here's a different way to look at it if the world economic system which is all of us the, the emergent complex behavior was built on theft then the mere reflection of the world might look like that and and the world the, the world economic system is going to be built on truth but it's going to take a long time and 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 if you meet people where they are they'll likely uh, they'll likely see it earlier and you'll help them mm. lovely that's a, a very nice very nice final note to um a great conversation that i've really enjoyed even though it's been in uh, two parts um so <laughs> thank you for coming along here jeff um i hope you have a great day thanks you too tatsuki <laughs>